Well, hello there, and welcome back to the Predictions and Trends 2012 series. I am Forrest Markers and Hopkins Editor in Chief of Silicon Angle, and I am joined today with Mark Phillip of Are You Watching This, a startup and app that we have covered several times on the pages of Silicon Angle, and uh, someone that I met at South by Southwest uh, back in March, and we talked a bit about his his project as well as his thoughts on the evolution of video and cable. And uh, I thought that he would be a great source of uh, you know an ear on the ground, so to speak, of, of what's going on in this space. This is something that we watch here at Silicon Angle. So uh, welcome you to the program, Mark. Thank you much, Mark. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. So uh, I kind of wanted to uh, start out a little bit uh, for those that aren't familiar with your uh, with your project, your app. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about what's new with Are You Watching This and what it does, first of all, and then, you know, what, because uh, you had an announcement uh, last week, I believe it was. That's right. You know, I've, uh, as far as startups go, I'm a bit of a senior citizen. I've been around since, uh, <laughs> since 2006, and the, the startup world was very different back then. Mm -hmm. The vision from the beginning is helping sports fans get to the couch at just the right time. I've always been frustrated by hearing about a game the next day when I've you know, gone to sleep early or I was raking the leaves or something equally as boring. So the goal has been getting those alerts and then getting someone to the TV. So just recently we launched an app for Android that started as a Google TV app and then grew into a smartphone and tablet app also. Mm -hmm. That not only gives you the requisite scores and news that you'd expect from any sports app, but it gives you alerts, it gives you lots of interesting filtering, and the ability to pair with your Google TV, TiVo, or Direct TV receiver so that you can sort of swipe from game to game or click on a station level and have it change channels, getting us away from that boring and you know, sort of... Uh, antiquated programming guide that we're all used to mm -hmm. into something more intuitive. Right. Well, and uh, it's been, uh, so you've, I got the screenshots and I think, uh, I think it was Maria that may have written it up or Siraj that uh, talked about uh, all the different uh, new apps or new versions of the app, I think they are, that uh, for Google TV and of course they were already available on Android and iOS. So, uh, and they look a really good, very uniform experience across all, all the platforms it looks like. It's been very interesting, and I think I'll, there's always the question with developers about fragmentation on Android. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had started early with a native Android app, I would have been just as frustrated as them. Mm -hmm. But starting from Honeycomb on, it was really getting the Galaxy Tab from Google I.O. last year is what really got me going with yeah. the native app. Starting from that point on, it was actually a great experience. It's one code base runs on the phones, tablets, and Google TV couple of statements here and there, figuring out if you want a big device or a small device. But if you start from that point on, it was a, a great program experience. Uh, I've been a now and then user of Android. I, uh, I've, I've switched and used just about every platform. Uh, but uh, I recently came back, uh, I don't know where I put my tablet down, but I have a, I have a new tablet, new Android tablet honeycomb, running Honeycomb, and it's uh, a much smoother and better experience, uh, just all around. Uh, uh, it's, it's a great... It's a great platform. It's, I'd say compared to maybe like the iPad, it's like 80% there, which is pretty good, you know? It is. And I'm really curious what ice cream sandwich on the tablets are going to look like. Mm -hmm. I think ice cream sandwich on the phone is new to a lot of people, but of the small minority of us that have the honeycomb tablets, right. a lot looks really similar. So uh, I don't think it's going to be a light year's change when you go to the ice cream sandwich on the tablets, but I think there's some a couple questions I'm curious how they're going to answer. Right, when you kind of the the last you know mile or whatever you want to call it for the mobile development experience, it's it's certainly it's certainly getting there. I mean, it, the 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 big thing for me, uh, and I think that'll really it's 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 two things that are really I think holding back the Android tablet experience. Uh, it's kind of off topic for us today, but uh, interesting nonetheless is the uh, the fact that so many of these tablets are tethered to a service. And the ones that are not tethered to a service are not necessarily the premium tablets that are out there. I found one, the Toshiba Thrive, which is certainly a pretty decent uh, tablet. Uh, it still has it still has some minor problems, but uh, you know it's it's fast and it's not tethered, which is a big thing for me. So, sure. You know, and and uh, that's uh, th that'll come along. I'm sure it's just the evolution of a market, but. Uh, 
So, so talk about developing for uh, Google TV, DirecTV, and TiVo, which were the, the three uh, main uh, bullet points in the, in the recent release. Those, those, were, uh, those have changed dramatically over the last year. They have. You know, Google TV is it's such an interesting platform. I was a, a fanboy from before it started. Mm -hmm. uh, I was first in line to get the Google TV device at Best Buy when it first came out, and I was thoroughly disappointed. Yeah. Uh, any living room device that doesn't have a previous channel button mm -hmm. just shouldn't be launched. And I, I understand there are lots of interesting issues with working with set-top boxes where it's not easy to put that on there, but Already, when they first started, I was, I was pretty frustrated and felt they missed the mark. With Honeycomb, it gets a lot better. Granted, there aren't really new remote controls, but the experience is a lot better. Now there's an actual app store, so developers like me, whether I'm small or someone large like the NBA, can start building interesting apps. And I'm biased, but sports, I think, is what's really going to carry the day with a lot of these applications. With that, you start to see some interesting stuff, and I'm excited about the, the remote control stuff that we're able to do from the phone, from the tablet, to interact. But I found remote controlling the Google TV, at least implementing that, was a lot harder than implementing that on DirecTV or TiVo. Interesting. For TiVo and DirecTV, they have unbelievably easy APIs to interact with. Hmm. And they're not private, they're completely public. Anyone that Googles tel uh, TiVo API, actually, Google TiVo Telnet API, mm -hmm. or, or DirecTV SHEF is the acronym, CHEF. Mm -hmm. DirecTV actually uses a simple web service. You hit a URL and pass in the channel number, and it changes. Hmm. For TiVo, you just Telnet support 31339, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Pass it in a couple commands, and it changes right away. So those APIs have been around for years, and I really didn't realize. I'm surprised more apps haven't tied into it. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and all around, this is this is one of the things that I don't think people talk about enough uh, in uh, the kind of the new TV space uh, is the fact that APIs aren't very particularly uniform or uh, easy to work with in all cases. I know the Netflix API is particularly unwieldy, and you know they're everywhere, so you can't really ignore them. Uh, in most cases, if you're kind of a video uh, video developer, right. Absolutely. And even just developing for these two devices, the customer support for Telnet is very different than the customer support for someone trying to connect to the Direct TV. So it's been it's been interesting because it's been new for me and new for a lot of the users figuring out, wait, is my receiver actually connected to my home network or not? Right. So putting it in an FAQ was, was huge for cutting down some of the support emails I was getting mm -hmm. because not only is it a new app, but it's, it's a new experience for a lot of us. Said remote control from a separate device. Well, uh, let's skip around a little bit because I, I, there's there's a lot of, of talking points between here and the next question that I'm going to ask you. But uh, the Xbox, I have to ask because we're looking at developing some apps for the new Xbox uh, platform for our video operation, and uh, there I'm finding that there's a a, uh, a <laughs> there's not very many developers that are out there that'll say they're developing for the Xbox platform. They're working for EA or somebody if they are. So uh, and and it's it's a difficult API to get your head around. Uh, granted, it's the same XNA framework that they use for the mobile platform. So you'd think there'd be some people out there that do this stuff. But when you say I'm developing an Xbox app, you can hear the crickets in the room when you ask, "Is there anybody that's willing to develop this for me? I'll pay money." And sure. Yeah. There, there's not it's, a lot of them. It's interesting. Just. Just hearing people doing Windows mobile apps, let alone Xbox apps, mm -hmm. it's it's such a small community, and it's interesting because, you know, I think one of the big problems with Rim was that their relationship with the developers wasn't solid. And for anyone that tried to develop an app on them, that was the first platform I thought about. That was back in like '07 or '08, mm -hmm. back when I had a BlackBerry Pearl, and it was something like two hundred dollars to get into the program but that only counted for 10 revisions of your app. Yeah. And for it to be phrased like that was so off-putting. But then you look at what Microsoft is doing, and they, you know, you hear the stories of them paying developers to create apps on the platform. They're doing all these interesting, uh, you know, boot camps. They had one in Austin just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're really being aggressive about going after developers, and that's so important. But I don't understand why you still don't see more developers out there. Yeah. Especially with Xbox, I 
have had Xbox since the original. Mm -hmm. For me, it's generally just a, a Halo and a Rock Band device for me more than anything else. But going sort of bigger picture than that, that's how I keep up with my college buddies. I'm extremely entrenched with Xbox, and it's not a question of if I'm going to renew my Xbox Live account every year. It's okay, how early am I going to get it if I can find a good deal on that? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I am completely entrenched. So there's there's a big market there, but at the same time, I haven't built anything for Xbox or for Microsoft either. So uh, you know, I'll be at CES in gosh next week, mm -hmm. and Microsoft is doing a lot of stuff there. I'm going to go to a lot of their talks because there really is a lot of value there, especially when you start to look at some of the big players like the Comcast having arrangements with them, where Xbox is kind of a juggernaut. It's, it's moving slowly, but I think it's going to be around for a long time. Oh, 30 million. Well, first of all, I think they, <clears throat> maybe not decisively quite yet, but they've, they've won the console wars. I would, I would say, say it's fair to say that. Uh, PlayStation has lost money, or Sony's lost money uh, because of PlayStation last year. Nintendo is still trying to get, you know, relevant again. Uh, and, you know, they, there is Microsoft with 30 million Xbox Live subscribers, and they've just shoved video in their face uh, last month and said, here, watch live TV. Here, watch YouTube. And it's all, the thing that's so curious to me, and I, I want to get your take on this, is, uh, is that it's all side by side. It puts new media on equal footing with old media to a certain degree. Uh, I can watch anybody that has a YouTube channel. I can watch their you know full length programming uh, to the same you know the same level of comfort in my living room that I can watch anything on uh, you know my Verizon cable subscription. Yeah, it's it's interesting. The first real app that caught my eye was ESPN. Yes, it's so sports focused, and it's so interesting, especially someone like ESPN three or any of the smaller providers like uh, the Versus of the world, which is now NBC Sports. Mm -hmm. They're not in your regular flow of flipping through the channels. We all have our pattern, whether it's someone like me that goes ESPN, ESPN2, and then I'll hit USA and TBS, and I sort of cycle through in a loop. With ESPN3, it's not really a destination you go to unless there's something like your alma mater that you know you're going to tune in at 7 p.m. for. So putting it a little bit more in your face, I, I think it's really interesting and a great fit for ESPN3. Mm -hmm. The trouble is... There's a little bit of a cost in turning on my Xbox. You know, flipping through the channels is instant. For my Xbox, I generally have to find the controller. It's probably under that shelf where I normally keep it, push the button, wait for it to boot up. So that 15 second of waiting for it to get to the content I want, yeah. I think is an expensive 15 seconds. And I think so the Comcast stuff where it becomes your set top box, where it's always on removes that cost. And I think that changes things even more where we're used to getting this new media YouTube on our TV, at least the early adopters are. When you start to make that even easier to get to, and then sort of this, I don't know if you call it new or old media with ESPN3, mm -hmm. you put that on the same footing where all of a sudden it becomes this hodgepodge of everything where it's this limitless content, just a matter of which one you're going to pick because it's all right there in front of you. Right, right. Very interesting. And, and by the way, it brings me back to a request that uh, comes from my wife is uh, if you could start tracking all the college volleyball games with Are You Watching This? We have <laughs> She has become a fan of, of watching that. She, she's a volleyball player herself. Okay. And uh, she watches it all. ESPN3 has an amazing selection of uh, college volleyball and, of course, uh, some of the international teams as well. But Sure, Australian rules football is one that I find myself watching a lot on ESPN3. I'm not really sure why, <laughs> but it's it's interesting. I'd love to add more sports, but mm -hmm. the engine is is ready to go. Yeah. It's one of those things where getting data is amazingly expensive. I'm mm -hmm. still waiting for someone to come in and disrupt that a little bit. Yeah. But uh, just as a touch point, if I was to add, let's say, international soccer, yeah. it would double my sports cost per month. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting market. There, it's pretty much a duopoly. And I'm hoping we'll see uh, more competitors there soon. Mm, yeah, we'll talk about we'll talk about that off the air because I've got some I got some thoughts on that as well. We're we're of course big data. We play in big data. We've got a sure. couple of apps, and we we we've uh, seen some interesting cost structures around that as well. So, but uh, yeah, everything's NDA when you talk about those things. So <laughs> we can't talk about that on the camera. You can have it. The uh, the 
evolution of the Comcast platform and uh, the evolution of cable in general. So the the ones that have been on my radar, as I said before, uh, before we started taping, uh, were Verizon FiOS to a lesser degree, AT and T's Uverse and sure. Comcast. Uh, but uh, those are the ones that seem to be kind of innovating uh, from a device perspective or a uh, you know, kind of a how they offer their you know the networking perspective as well, certainly with FiOS and Uverse. But uh, from a platform perspective, it seems that Comcast and Verizon are leading the pack. I, that's just my perspective. You probably have a better uh, sense of this. So, what what are your what are you seeing there? Sure, I've I've had a lot more talks with Comcast than I have with Verizon. I'll, I'll say that up front. Mm -hmm. uh, Comcast with their Excalibur project, it's in some tests right now in Georgia, and it's supposed to be an amazing product. They're looking much more to be uh, a thin device, is I guess the best way to put it. I don't know how open they will be. I'm hoping that they will be very open. But I think uh, that they're creating something where developers will find it a lot easier to plug into. I did have a call with Verizon, and, and granted this was just one developer's experience a while back, uh, but I called them about building a widget, because I thought, It'd be a good fit. I love doing anything in the living room. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're maybe halfway through the call, maybe 20, 30 minutes or so, and uh, I asked her about cost, and she told me it would be $50,000 to get my app into their market. Wow. And I was, yeah. I, I was shocked, and I, you know, I apologize. I'm, I'm obviously wasting your time. There's no way I can pay yeah. I mean, just to get into your market. And I hope that's changed. Granted, that was at least a year ago. Um, and I haven't touched base with them since, so hopefully that's different. But I know when you look at Verizon, when you look at AT&T Uverse, they're very robust platforms. They can do a lot of interesting things. Uh, Uverse is the next platform we'll be supporting with the Are You Watching This app because they have an API you can plug into also. There's this sort of new, in the same way you have the, the Jet Blues of the world, this uh, the, the new metal that's able to do interesting things that the older guys have to retrofit to do. Mm -hmm. They have a bit of an advantage with the universe and files because it's brand new. How they'll interact with the developers is always the question. I know Comcast hasn't opened anything up yet, but I know I've had lots of great talks with them because they understand that working with developers is a good thing. It's just a matter of once they open the doors, what's the relationship going to be like? So, and I think this is this is uh, something that it bears discussion or maybe uh, emphasis. And this, this, this is uh, consistent across uh, from Verizon to other video developers, Microsoft with the XNA platform, all, all so many of these platforms. So with the XNA on Xbox, you have to pay to get into their API. Uh, it's not much, it's 300 bucks, but it's, there's still a barrier to entry. Of course, 50 grand is definitely the largest uh, barrier to entry I've heard of in this market, but it, it kind of bears out that that uh, cable and video providers have not yet discovered that which the mobile providers already know, uh, and that is when when you have a thriving app marketplace, you uh, it creates a whole new experience that you know it just creates an ecosystem. And, and I understand why. I mean, Microsoft has has given many numerous explanations as to why they charge people to develop on the Xbox, and that is to keep out. They don't want that big of an ecosystem. They don't want knockoffs of every game that they've paid licenses to, to to port to the Xbox. Certainly makes sense. So you put a minor barrier to entry there. But you know, in cases like Verizon, I can tell you as a subscriber, there's maybe like you know a half a dozen widgets in there, and they're all major brands that already have channels on the network. So uh, there's not a thriving ecosystem. The only one I think is non-network based is Twitter. Uh, and I think that may have been subsidized by CNN. So, interesting. Yeah, it was the same thing when you booted up a Google TV for the first time, the original version. You know, you see a bunch of big brands, and they do essentially what you thought they would do. It's Twitter on my TV. It's Pandora on my TV. It's Netflix on my TV. And there's nothing really paradigm shifting about it. You know, it's just the app on a bigger device. And so it's you're spot on when you're able to let. You know, the small guys like me who try to do something new, uh, we're more nimble than the, the NBA might be or Facebook might be, and we're willing to take more risks. And if you were able to open the door for a non, 
five-digit price, uh -huh. then you get to see some really interesting things and have people feel uh, attached to your device, whether it is DirecTV or Uverse or, or Verizon Pod. Yeah. So is that is that a, I'm going to I'm going to try to pin you down on a prediction. Is that something you, you expect to see in 2012? Is this, is there going to be is there going to be an opening of this? Is this going to be a, kind of more of the same? How, how does that you how do you expect that to change on in the next year? I think uh, if you look at Misa, mm -hmm. they've had a few announcements recently about uh, hooking up with DirecTV and with AT&T Uverse. Uh, now the companies are different. With setting something up to run on TiVo or DirecTV is easy. The APIs are out there. But for someone like Uverse, it's you have to talk to them, sign some things, but then you're good to go. I think you're going to see a lot more of those announcements. And don't use DirecTV as a barometer, but use the U-verses and the Verizon Fioses as a barometer, because those are gated for now. Right. The more announcements I think you see from startups being able to interact with those platforms let you know how much they're opening up, because I think those guys realize they have to. DirecTV, I know, knows they have to, and they're very good about talking to developers to get people on their platform. But I think the real barometer is whether those few providers stay closed, and if they are, how many developers are, are on that platform. So in here, there's a there's two kind of questions that are related. Um, one was kind of spurred by uh, Fred, Fred Wilson, uh, abc.com, uh, who proudly, I don't know, proudly maybe, but uh, very loudly trumpeted the fact that he pirated a Knicks game uh, over the weekend. I don't know if you saw that, but, uh, and the reason behind that was uh, there was a blackout and he couldn't watch what he wanted to watch. He would be more than willing to pay extra or whatever to watch a Knicks game, but he could not watch it. So he asked the internets and the internets told him how to pirate it and he did it. And it took a little snapshot of him watching it via, I think, YouTube or something. That's I thought I saw a YouTube logo in the corner, uh, a YouTube Live logo. <clears throat> anyway, he's watching it in the living room. So, uh, question uh, is, uh, there, there, there's been an interesting year for blackouts and abbreviated sports seasons. Do you think that uh, there will be any type of rise or maybe kind of shifts uh with, you know, piracy, because piracy is a major driver of innovation and change, disruption, uh, this year with uh, how sports is consumed? It's a great question. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was watching that closely because I'm, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I am a Knicks mm -hmm. fan. And I feel like we might do some good stuff this year. Uh, <laughs> it is, it's tough because we're getting to the point where we're having these large packages pushed in our faces for all sports leagues, whether it's NFL, NBA, NHL, Center Ice. You can get some sort of package for $150 to $250 that lets you get every game for the season. But most of us don't want to watch every single one. Right. If you're, you know, for football, it's maybe 250 to, to 300 games offhand. But really, I want to watch about 15 or 20 of them that I wouldn't normally get. One of the you know, the, the visions I see for Are You Watching This is you get an alert that says something like, LeBron has scored 60 points through three quarters. Do you want to pay $1.99 to watch the last quarter? Ah. Or if for some reason my alma mater is in some national championship, and I went to MIT, so it's probably some Division three AA championship, <laughs> but if there was a way to watch, you know, overtime for some reason, I'd pay $2.99 to get that on my TV or on my phone somewhere. Yeah. But... With these large leagues, because of the relationships with the cable companies, I don't think you're ever going to see anytime soon that sort of a la carte, let me pay $10 for one game. It gets very complicated. It's very frustrating because I think someone like the NBA, I'd love to sell my data to them to power something like that. That yeah. would on demand watch a portion of the game. But even if they were to pay you know, proportionally much more for that game relative to the $150, $200 for the season package, it's not going to happen. And a lot of that just has to do with the licensing rights and the distributor rights with the major cable companies. Yeah, again, not to keep going back to the Xbox, that's one of the things that excites me about it is because you're seeing sports being, you know, sports is always the biggest anchor to cable that we have. Right. And and uh, because it's, it's one of the few things that's worth watching live as opposed to on demand. And... Uh, 
the, uh, the the fact that it's got ESPN three, but also I don't know if you noticed, but in the coming app section, the MLB TV thing is coming. I didn't notice that. Yeah, it, it, it's over. You got to scroll all the way over to the end of the apps marketplace and what's coming in 2012. And uh, MLB is launching an app that I presume lets you watch live games. I haven't heard much about it. Uh, maybe on demand games. I don't know how much value that would be. But uh, something by MLB, probably pretty similar to what's offered on their website and their subscription packages um, on the Xbox. So uh, that. That, of course, you know, shifting you know, consumption habits to a device. Also, uh, a slight detethering from the cable company. You know, it's, it's, it's bits and pieces, dribs and drabs. But I do have some hope that, you know, this, this, is, this is a portent of, of things to come, you know. It's interesting. I, I watch ESPN closely because, you know, I don't know how many people understand the, the subscriber rates and the licensing fees, but ESPN makes more than four dollars a month for every subscriber every month hmm. so if you have espn on your cable provider four dollars of your bill more than goes to espn for just espn it's a dollar something for espn too it's it's a lot of money they make billions and billions of dollars on their on their licensing fees from cable and satellite companies because espn is doing interesting stuff with espn3 i think a lot of folks are watching it very closely because the last thing ESPN wants to do is cannibalize cable because that's where they make their money. But at the same time, they're doing really innovative stuff with ESPN3. Well, I mean, that's what you got to love about ESPN. I mean, that, that, that's another, if you, if you watch anything by John Furrier, uh, one of my partners in crime here at Silicon Angle, you can tell he's a student of ESPN because of, uh, I mean, it's a lot of what we've done with our video operation we've modeled around the early days of uh, ESPN in the 70s and 80s, starting out in a trailer in Connecticut and, uh, you know, going from there to, you know, where they are now. I mean, you watch, like, you can go to YouTube, and this is it's absolutely fascinating to watch, you know, live ESPN covering NCAA, NCAA fencing or <laughs> Division Three cross-country or something like yeah. that. And, uh, you know, that was, and, and then, you know, they get up to, you know, actual major major league events in, in these days and, and the, the journey from here to there required a lot of uh, you know run and gun and uh, on, on, on the cheap shoestring stuff uh, they basically had to evolve with the market and recognize where you know where they needed to be you know in terms of technology uh, to to make the money and, and, and do what it is they want to do with sports and I think what's so interesting about it is the ESPN of the 70s and 80s it's the ESPN three of now. Mm -hmm. It's just college volleyball. It's Australian rules football. It's just the random sports that you'll pick up. One, well, it's similar, but in ways it's so different because they could put so much more out there. But it's all about cannibalization. Do they want to start pulling stuff off ESPN two and put on ESPN three on the risk of people stopping their or cutting the cord of their cable? Mm -hmm. I think sports is. The glue, it is the sheath that keeps people from cutting that cord because there just aren't viable options if you are a sports fan. Yeah. yeah. So at some point, they're going to have to, because I mean, it, it, right now, when it's with, because I'm on the Verizon, of course, and I've got all these options with the Xbox, but they're all tethered to the fact that I must have a video subscription for it to work over the data channel. But at some point, you have to, you have to assume they're going to you know, give you an option to pay directly. If they see usership of their app exceed a certain threshold or something, they're gonna, you know, I wonder, how, I wonder how many of these people would pay us a dollar or four dollars. Sure, I mean, it, maybe it's something like Hulu, Hulu Plus, I mean, that would make a, a ton of sense to me. And I think there are a lot of people. I think there are a lot of people that would easily pay five dollars a month, ten dollars a month to get ESPN three with, with multiple tiers. And I think if they slowly work people into that. Then I think you'll start to see, you know, maybe it's a bowl game here and there. Maybe it's uh, a late season, but regular season NBA game on there. And right. They even had a World Series game live on ESPN3. That's true. That's true. And I, I think they're playing with it. And I think they are going to lead the way as far as media goes because everyone wants to know what they're going to do because they make the most money out of anyone mm -hmm. from the person's Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, I 
think we've covered just about anything. So what what is it that you expect to see that's going to change change the way cable is consumed or change the way that you interact with cable over 2012? What are, what are the things that you're planning on uh, planning on happening next year? Well, I don't think there are many apps like mine that are doing the remote control sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are the the standard you know devices that you'll get like the Google TV standard remote. There are really interesting companies like Peel that are doing really cool things with hardware and software to help uh, obliterate the EPG that we're used to and get you to a more customized guide of what's on TV. But I think it's going to become commonplace. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more apps taking advantage of the massive amount of content that is coming over the pipe and directing you to the best thing to watch right now. Yeah. I'm focused just on sports. I have thought for years that someone would come in and really focus on curating the rest of the content on TV. I mean, there, there's a there's a, a bounty of news uh, content, and, and Lord knows there are people out there that know how to curate news. So Absolutely. And even with, with just linear content, I, I talked about the loop that I have where I go through all my channels, and I remember one day I accidentally hit down when I meant to hit up, mm-hmm. and I ended up on oxygen, <laughs> which isn't my demographic at all. Yeah. But they were playing Ocean's 12. <laughs> and I love Ocean's 12. So yeah. I love Ocean's 12. And so whether it's you know Pirates of the Caribbean on ABC Family, whether it's uh, a 007 movie on sci-fi, there's all this great content in places that you may not know where to look. Mm-hmm. There's a wide open space. I'd love to see like the guys at Miso, the guys at Get Glue, go after this more because I think it's ripe and no one's going after it. There's a lot of stuff that could be done there. Just like, are you watching this? But beyond sports, getting into movies and all that. I think I think part of it is the interface, though, because what what I've always thought, and maybe maybe it'll work with Google TV better than some of the set top boxes. But you know, curation in in no small part is a that is about uh, the interface with which it's pre- presented, and uh, the cable companies have total control over that and don't you know really wish to relinquish what it looks like to any developer that may want to skin it. Uh, and I think if there's any one thing that would dramatically change uh, what types of things are developed for these platforms, that would have to be it. I think you're right. The I think the Trojan horse, though, is a lot of these APIs. Mm-hmm. If you can get, if you can pull someone's Facebook locks, if you can pull their their Get Glue or Miso check-ins, you have eighty percent of the problem solved there of what they want to watch. Yeah. If you can start plugging into the DirecTV API or the Pivo API which you don't need permission for, you can just start building today, developers. Just start building something cool to say, I'm not going to show you a guide of 1,500 channels. I'm going to show you a list of the five things on TV that we think you'll like. We won't even tell you the channel number because the channel number doesn't matter. Right. When I want to watch a video, I don't care what's on Vimeo or YouTube or anything like that. I just want to see this funny cat that's playing the piano. So give me the movies, give me the shows that are on TV, and take me to it, which is essentially what I do with Are You Watching This? But there's so many more genres that could be explained. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, I think we've, we've covered a, a wide swath of, uh, of information from mobile to TV to the future of new media. So is there anything else you want to say before we tag this thing out and let people enjoy 2012 for themselves? Oh, yes. Uh, I don't want to keep them from that. Uh, anyone with an Android <laughs> phone, uh, go check out Are You Watching This? It's in the market. I'd love to hear what you think. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Mark Phillip, for joining me, and uh, we will see you all throughout the new year, and I hope to see you at South by Southwest this year again. I'll see you then, Michael.